Hello health fans! Today we're going to talk about weight loss and belly fat as presented on the Dr. Oz show. More people than ever are having problems with obesity, belly fat and weight loss. More people than ever are trying but it's a minority that are succeeding. Why is that? So today I'm going to take a look at a couple of videos that are presented to the masses and we're going to talk about if the advice in there is correct and if it's useful coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. At least in America, probably everyone has heard of Dr. Oz. He's got a popular talk show on TV and he has a YouTube channel where he puts short video clips. So today I'm going to take a quick look at those clips and we're starting with the owner's manual to weight loss. Let's take a look. The number one thing people ask me about is dieting. And the problems with conventional diets is they depend on willpower. Let me ask you a question. How many of you can hold your breath indefinitely underwater? Pretty hard, right? Possible. Why? Because your biology will always beat your willpower. No matter how much you want to diet, it ain't going to work. What you can do though is nudge the biology blubber in the right direction. So right off the bat, he brings up one of the biggest problems that people are interested in dieting, but it's not really dieting they are interested in. They're interested in weight loss and they think that dieting will lead to weight loss. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And Dr. Oz brings up an excellent point here. He says that between willpower and biology, biology will always win. All right, and then I'm a little curious because it says you can't really use willpower to overcome biology, but you can nudge it a little bit. So I'm curious to what he's going to say about that. The first thing you got to figure out is what are you measuring? What does success look like? Well, it turns out it's not your weight, it's your waist size, which is the best predictor of health. The ideal waist size measured at your belly button is about half your height. If you've got too much belly fat, problems start to happen. And here's the big one. Let's look at the momentum. This is an animation. See that yellow stuff there? That's the omentum. And that pad, we're going to get rid of that for a second. There's the liver up there, the gallbladder, the green stuff. And there's the stomach of the food you ate earlier today, and it's being pushed down to the small bowel. Your bowel is going to mix that with bile, the green stuff from the gallbladder. And like a soap, it'll wash it and help it absorb through this very thin wall to the big portal vein. This vein carries all the nutrients to the liver. No matter what you eat, the liver's going to metabolize it and send it out to the body. If you eat healthy stuff, the liver's going to love that. If you eat unhealthy stuff, the liver will turn fat. This fat liver afflicts a quarter of the population. And then this momentum starts to get ponderously large as it pulls way across and becomes that big beer belly that so many folks have. I love his animations, how they're showing all this stuff happening and the food gets into the intestine and the bile is added. But that's a bit of an oversimplification because bile is only to break down the fat and fat is only one of the food components. There's other enzymes. There's enzymes for carbohydrate and there's enzymes for protein and so forth. But then all of these foodstuffs, they enter into the liver through the portal vein. And then he says that if you eat healthy stuff, the liver is happy. But if you eat unhealthy stuff, then the, you get a fatty liver and that fat kind of spreads out into the abdominal cavity and into the omentum. So, I'm curious to see if we're going to find out what this healthy and unhealthy stuff really is. The reason your belly gets big is not because you got a little fat beneath the skin. You get big fat under the muscle, way inside where those organs are that I showed you. When you have this big pad of momentum here slopping up inside of your intestines, there's no way your body can keep up with it. And it causes coronary artery disease, it causes diabetes, it causes hypertension. That's what I'm focused on today because this belly fat poisons your liver causing high cholesterol, it squeezes the kidneys, and the kidneys have to jack up your blood pressure because the kidneys regulate your blood pressure, and it also poisons the ability of insulin to work. This big fat yellow piece was of course the omentum, but this omentum, when he goes on to explain what it does, he says it causes all these different problems. It causes coronary artery disease, it says it causes diabetes, it causes increased blood pressure. He says the omentum, the fat, the belly fat 
poisons the liver to raise cholesterol. It squeezes the kidneys. That was a new one to me and raises blood pressure and it poisons the ability of insulin to do its job and therefore you get type 2 diabetes. So most of that is not only incorrect but it's backwards because the belly fat is not the cause. It might be slightly perpetuating the problem but it's not the cause. It's the result of an imbalance in the body and that imbalance is called insulin resistance and it's caused by sugar, glucose, and fructose. Sugar consists of equal parts glucose and fructose. And it's the fructose that clogs up the liver more than anything else because all other foods can be processed by a wide variety of cells in the body, but the fructose can only be processed by the liver. So even a small amount of fructose is going to clog up that liver very, very quickly. Okay? So he never talked about that. He talked about the fat being emulsified by the bile and I don't think that he was necessarily saying that it was the fat clogging up the liver, but the truth is that it's the fructose that clogs up the liver. So all of these things that he says were caused by the belly fat are actually the result of insulin. The belly fat is the result of insulin and cortisol and all of these are also results. So again, he's falling for an association that we observe two things together and we think that one is the cause of the other and we all hate fat. We have a, a universal fat phobia so everything gets blamed on fat. It is not true that high blood pressure is caused by fat squeezing on the kidneys. While it is true that the kidneys regulate blood pressure, it's the nervous system, it's the brain, it's your sympathetic nervous system and the endocrine system that releases the appropriate signals and the appropriate hormones to tell the kidneys how to filter and how to regulate the fluid pressure. All right? And it's not the fat squeezing on the kidneys causing anything. Belly fat does not poison the ability of insulin. Belly fat is the result of insulin, which is the result of fructose. All right? So most of it is incorrect and all of it is backward. Again, a, a victim for, of observing things and associating rather than understanding the mechanism that causes it. What are the key five numbers? You gotta know your weight, your waist size, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and your fasting blood sugar. All of those are interrelated to your weight. And the best way to change these numbers, therefore, is to lose that weight. Even a small loss can make a huge difference. Just lose the weight. Why didn't I think of that? So now he's coming full circle here. First, he's talking about weight loss, and then he says it's not really about the weight loss, it's about the biology and the way you want to measure things is really the belly fat which is more important to measure than the weight and then he says that these are the things you want to measure. You want to measure the weight, the waist size, blood pressure, cholesterol and fasting, blood glucose. But then he goes back and says these are all related to weight so just lose the weight. Why didn't I think of that? So it's all circular reasoning here. Everyone who has try to lose weight obviously has thought of losing weight. That's not really solving the problem. So again, we're, we're stuck in that thinking that weight is the problem, but it's not. So he started off beautifully saying that it's biology, willpower versus biology. Willpower will always lose because you can't go hungry. You can't hold your breath forever. But let's see here if we can come up with a solution. If he has a way to nudge the biology into losing the weight and the belly fat. How do you lose weight? Well, a couple action steps that make sense. High fiber breakfast. Get started the right way. It'll keep you going all day long. It'll keep you satiated. You won't be foraging for food at 10 in the morning like a rodent. Number two, you can have your snacks. I want you eating all day long, but keep the snacks smaller than a fist. And always wash down the snacks with water to get that hedonistic desire to have more snacks out of your system. That way you'll be satiated and comfortable for a couple hours. Don't eat food within three hours of bedtime because that way you go to sleep without the extra calories and you wake up in the morning feeling nourished, you sleep better as well. And you gotta move 30 minutes a day. 
Okay, I'm kind of disappointed here because he said that willpower will never trump biology and then he goes right back into the same usual advice of eat less and exercise more, eat small snacks, drink lots of water and all that. So there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing new here. Okay, a high fiber breakfast, then that's not a bad idea to eat more fiber, but if you really want to lose weight, then maybe you want to eat some food so that eventually you don't need a breakfast at all. That's called intermittent fasting. And then he says, I want you to eat all day, but I want your snacks to be smaller than a fist and then wash them down with plenty of water so that maybe you'll last a couple of hours. That is called carb dependence. That means that your blood sugar operates like that of a hummingbird, that you have to top off your blood sugar every couple of hours because you are carb dependent. It's really, really sad that our ancestors, they ate once a day, twice a day, every other day, whenever food was available. And now we've become a species that have to wash things down with lots of water. So maybe we'll last a couple of hours. It's really sad that we've come to have that expectation that we don't understand that if you are truly satiated, if you eat real food, then you can go a half a day or a day and not really get hungry. And even if you get a little hungry, you still function perfectly. Next one, no food for three hours before bed. That's a pretty good one. That's part of intermittent fasting of shrinking your feeding window, extending your fasting window. He said it would help to keep the calories down, which is of course not the objective, but it's still a good thing to do to shrink your feeding window. And last on his list of solutions is to move 30 minutes per day. And I couldn't agree more, but not to lose weight. Okay. It's not going to hurt you if you do it aerobically, but it's not going to help a whole lot either because the real problem is insulin resistance and this exercise can reduce the insulin resistance of the muscles to some degree, but it will have a minimal or non-existent effect on the insulin resistance of the liver, which is what we're talking about in this video. So move 30 minutes a day, great, but not for the reasons of weight loss. So while this list has a few items that will help marginally, the no food three hours will help a little bit with insulin resistance. The movement might help just a tiny, tiny little bit. None of the others will really help you at all in terms of insulin resistance. What they are suggesting is just another diet in which you will require a lot of willpower, which will never work in the long run. So again, we have to get to the root cause, cut the carbs, cut the frequency of meals. He said he wants you to eat all day, but keep the snacks small. Well, again, we don't want to eat all day. We want to eat for as short as period as possible to allow that insulin to drop. So we're trying to show what, what might happen when, when you start eating a lot of sugars and that that might make you fat. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, let's find out. We'll this have what, this. Th th what is this, your body? So this will represent our, our belly. Okay. And this will represent uh, whether or not uh, eating lots of sugars can affect the size of your belly. Is we should be close to it, far from it? Yeah, I would step back a little bit here. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to add this in. Are we ready? All right, here we go. Three, two, one. See, that goes in. Well, that's not bad. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh. The fat literally overgrows your body. It's uncontrollable. It overwhelms you. Unbelievable. Taking over everything. Right. And this. Done it again. Yeah. I, yeah, I probably wouldn't touch that. Yeah. Okay, wrap, wipe it out his jacket. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, but here, if you look at this stuff, this overwhelming bulge of fat is what we experience, and it's the sugar, the sugar, wow. the refined carbs that causes the problem. So now that we've established that's the problem, the question is, what do you do about it? And I actually think the solution is not cutting out fats, it's maybe cutting out bad fats, but it's adding back the good fats, the right fats. Bob, show us. Yeah, so we start doing that, and what we should start seeing is our fats going down. Wow. Melts. Look at that. Down, and melting that away. It's melting away. 
disappearing <laughs> as he does that. Because the fat cells in your body actually panic if they don't have the right fats around them. If you can oh, okay. soothe them by eating the fats that reduce inflammation in the body, then guess what? Your fat says, oh, it's okay. And it begins to melt away. Hilarious science experiment, but the only thing it really tells me is that you shouldn't drink those two chemicals that they mixed in that big bowl. Of course, they're finally making a good point here that it's the sugar. Now, the illustration, really, I'm not sure where they were going with that, but it's entertaining. It's really cool. And it's sugar and carbs, refined carbs, like they're saying. But then Dr. Oz goes on to try to explain this. And now he says, well, how do we, how do we get rid of this? And then they start throwing some sand or something on this foam. And this is to illustrate the sand is added good fats. And if you add good fats, then they'll melt the fat away. Dr. Oz tries to explain and he says, well, you know, the fat cells panic. If they don't have good fat around them, then they panic. But if they have good fat, then they shrink. And of course, I don't know what they're, what he's trying to accomplish with that explanation. If they just sort of the script writers just made that up to have something to say. But of course, the mechanism is absurd. That is, has nothing to do with it because the belly fat, it's true, it's caused by sugar and especially fructose. But it's not the good fats that's going to melt the fat away, it's the removing of the glucose and the fructose. So Liz, what are the best fats to fight belly fat? Monounsaturated fatty acids, MUFAs in other words. And we want to have one serving of them at every meal and snack throughout the day. And this is going to shut down those fat cells and help stabilize the blood sugar, which as we know is what's really behind the belly fat. And MUFAs are olive oils, nuts, nut butters, avocado, and a little piece of dark chocolate. So these healthy fats are called MUFAs, monounsaturated fatty acids. And the, where they got that idea from is that the Mediterranean diet is generally considered healthy and olive oil is the predominant staple in the Mediterranean diet and if they're healthy then it must be the monounsaturated fatty acids in the olive oil that is causing the good health. No, it's the absence of sugar in the Mediterranean diet. Olive oil and monounsaturated fats are just another good fat. And the reason they're good is that they are minimally processed, right? We've gotten this idea that monounsaturated is good and polyunsaturated is good maybe and saturated is bad for sure, but it's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with how natural and how processed is the oil. And the reason olive oil is healthy is because it's minimally processed. Avocados are minimally processed. Nuts are minimally processed. So these all get a check mark because they are good fats. Now what they also say is you should eat them one serving with every meal. And that's a great idea as long as every meal isn't six times a day. All right. It's still about reducing insulin and then we want to reduce the number of meals. But here's the problem with this. They think that the olive oil will do something, that the, the healthy fats will do something. It's not that they're doing anything. It's that they're replacing the sugar that is harming you. All right. They're allowing you to eat less of the bad stuff and still be full. These have nothing to do with it other than that they're an alternative. Another interesting point is that they think it's about the monounsaturated fatty acids, yet they exclude beef. I didn't see her mentioning beef or meat fat or pork or tallow or lard. The beef fats are much higher in monounsaturated fats than chocolate. They've accepted for some peculiar reason. I mean, I agree that chocolate is an okay fat, but if they think that saturated fat is bad, then I don't see how they can accept chocolate because chocolate is super high in saturated fat and quite low in monounsaturated fat. Beef is much better in that regard and yet 
they think that beef is bad and chocolate's good. So there's no rhyme or reasons. We're just picking these factoids, these loosely placed items and if everyone agrees on olive oil, then let's call that a good one. If everyone agrees that beef is bad, then let's skip that one. All right. So we have to start understanding why these fats are good. They're good because they're minimally processed. They're good because they're replacing the bad stuff, the sugar and the carbs and the fructose. And while she was saying that, she also managed to get in some more false statements in there that we really have to start understanding that the monounsaturated fatty acids will not shut down fat cells. Okay, that is wrong. It's the reduced insulin that allows the body to burn that fat. The blood sugar is not behind the belly fat. There are two things that are behind belly fat and one is insulin and the other is fructose. Insulin indirectly, if it's high enough, long enough, it will create insulin resistance. Fructose will create a direct insulin resistance by clogging up the liver. So the blood sugar is not really the thing. It has a small part behind it in that it triggers insulin, but fructose is the big thing and fat has basically nothing to do with that. So the single biggest problem with this whole line of reasoning is that they're always going after the symptom and not the cause. And they're thinking that the healthy fat is going to do something. Take this for that. They're finally realizing that it's not the saturated fat that's causing the belly fat, it's the sugar, but now they think that it's the good fats that's gonna burn the fat and they're disconnecting the mechanisms and now people are all confused again because if you just add more fats without reducing the carbs, now they did say the sugar and the refined carbs are the cause, but they never tell you to actually reduce them. I don't know if that's implied or if they just tell you that, well, eat more fats. That's not a good idea because if you keep eating the same level of carbs, then you're still going to have the same amount of insulin and you will not burn off any belly fat. In fact, it will probably make it worse if you maintain the same level of sugar and carbohydrate. So I do like that the Dr. Oz show is trying to raise the awareness. It is bringing up a conversation on a national level about health awareness, about issues that we need to do something. I don't like so much maybe that it tends to be a bit shallow and I don't think people leave with a whole lot more information than they came with. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure you check out that one. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.